setting your investment criteria for self storage investing. This is basically a part two to what we covered last week when we talked about evaluating markets for self storage deals, evaluating markets for self storage deals. What we'll do is a little quick recap of that. And you can see John, it's myself and co-host uh, John Allen is with us this week. John will obviously uh, give us a little intro here in a minute. I, I'll do the uh, recap from last week and then we'll jump into this week's um, session and topic here. So, um, but evaluating markets for self storage deals, we covered real quick as a quick review, five data points we look at, population growth, average household income, median household income, and remember, we want the average to be above the median. If you don't know why, just look up uh, average versus median and you can find out, okay? We want the average to be above the median. We look at the median house value and we also look at the supply of storage in a market. Now, we're not scared of supply. Uh, another part of what we talked about was why square feet per person doesn't matter. In other words, why the supply doesn't matter too much. It does matter, but it's not the end all be all. Right, we talked about how the average in a market or across the U.S. is seven feet of storage per person, seven square feet of storage per person across the U.S. That means there's an average seven feet per person, every man, woman, and child across the U.S. That does not indicate demand in a particular market. Demand could be ten feet, it could be fifteen, it could be five, it could vary in there. The way you'd figure that out is by doing some legwork and making phone calls or site visits to competing facilities. So if you have a deal you're looking at, find out the comps around it, make phone calls, talk to the managers, or even stop by and see how full they are. See if you can gauge and get that information. John and I actually stopped by uh, a deal that we put an LOI on last week. We're working on the contract for that now, but we stopped by one of the comps. Remember that, John? And we walked in and the guy just started blurting out information. Um, and he, yep, <laughs> he, just, yep. he just said, "I'm you guys, I'm 90 something percent occupied. I forgot his rents for a 10 by 10 was like, I don't remember now, 150 or something like that. So really high for a 10 by 10 climate controlled facility, uh, unit. So like, okay, great. That helps a ton. Now we know you're 90 something percent occupied. So there's a lot of information you can gather from just doing that. And that's what's going to help you understand, hey, is demand strong in this market? Not necessarily the square feet per person. So don't be scared. It's very rare. Would you say, John, very rare for us to look at a deal and to have it be less than seven feet per person. I mean, yeah, that'd be extremely rare. Yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't, ha it happens, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, so usually you're going to see something maybe closer to 10, uh, 15, somewhere within that range. And that's okay. Don't let it scare you from looking at a deal, but you got to dig in a little deeper. All right. And then we talked about how to quickly disqualify a deal within 15 minutes. The quickest way is to have your pricing criteria uh, right up front and to know what you're looking for because then you get OMs from brokers and you look at deals like the price is too high, price is too high, you know right away, don't waste your time looking at it, right? Um, but if it's right in that sweet spot of where you think debt and equity kind of makes sense for the deal, um, then you can look at it and say, yeah, this may, meets my uh, dollar amount criteria and it's in the right market for the most part, right? It's in the markets I'm looking at. Let's dig a little bit deeper um, and see where we are. So that's a recap from last week. Happy to answer any questions on that in the Q&A. We will leave some time towards the end uh, for maybe 15, 20 minutes or so of Q&A. I think that's the most interesting part for you guys. So I know you can't talk, but just type, get ready to type your questions uh, in the Q&A for uh, John and myself, okay? So for this week, we will jump into some of the topics. We kind of alluded to it a little bit, let me pull it up. Uh, where to go here? I just lost it. Give me one second, guys and gals. For this week, um, obviously, we're looking at, hey, why is it important to set criteria? You know, we talked about the market and all that stuff. But let's jump into that a little bit more. So, John, um, real quick, before we get to the questions and all that, give the folks here just a little bit about your background uh, and what you did before joining Passive Investing, just so everybody can kind of get to know you a little bit. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so my background is actually accounting. Um, I started out at a CPA firm uh, in my career, worked there for about 10 years, focused on real estate clients. Uh, from there, I went to a family office in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, um, involved in a bunch of different type of businesses, one of which is commercial real estate, which is where, uh, where they had me. Uh, and then I met Chris about, uh, Chris about two years ago, I guess now, close yeah. to two years. Yeah, it was about two years. Um, yeah. So, uh, and you guys know Chris's background uh, for sure. So we were 
looking for some deals. And then uh, as we were closing on our first one, we partnered with PassiveInvesting.com. Uh, so that's a, a quick summary of my background. Yeah. Uh, so I'm go ahead. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm the numbers guy. Uh, so I know we've talked a little bit about underwriting on these webinars here. Uh, and that's where I'm, that's, that's where my uh, focus is. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think for you guys tuning in to the webinars on a weekly basis, John will be chiming in here every so often. I think your next one isn't for another four weeks or so, but if you guys have questions on underwriting, John will be talking about some of those topics, which I think will be very, very helpful. We've covered it at a high level. That's not my strong point. Right, I can do it, but John is going to be the 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 go to guy for that on our team. So if you guys have questions on underwriting, hop in the Facebook group um, as he's able to. John will hop in there and answer any questions you guys have uh, on that topic. So it's a pretty deep and broad topic. So uh, we'll do our best to help you guys out. Richard's asking, please repeat last week's bullets. We will we'll do that in the Q and A session part of it. Okay, we won't. Want, I don't want to go back to that just now. So, but Richard, I didn't miss your question. Um, all right. So let's talk about it real quick, John. Why is it important to set your investment criteria up front? Yeah. So there's a couple of reasons where that, where that's really important. Uh, number one, you know, one of the things that stops a lot of people who are getting started in whatever kind of investing is, you know, what we all know as analysis paralysis, you know, you can get stuck analyzing something to death uh, and you can waste a lot of time doing that. And if you have well, one of the ways to avoid that is to have your investment criteria nailed down, because otherwise you're going to be looking at a specific deal from every possible angle and you're going to get stuck. You know, um, mm -hmm. so you're just going to spend a lot of time on that. And, you know, the, the most valuable resource that we have is time. Uh, you can never make more time. You can always make more of just about anything else. So you don't want to be spending all of your time on a deal that, you know, if you had had a criteria defined at the beginning that you never would have done it anyway, you know, yeah. it doesn't always matter how good the numbers are. If it doesn't fit what you're trying to accomplish as an investor, then it's not a good deal for you. So it's yeah. very important to have this nailed down when you're starting. Yeah, that's right. I always look at this stuff from kind of like a single family home perspective. So if I'm going to go out and buy a house now, especially in this market, when it's a strong seller's market uh, in, in the residential space, if I'm with my family looking for a house, I'm not going to go just look at any house, right? A $200,000 home, three bedroom, two bath, and then a five bedroom, 3000 square foot house. Like that doesn't make any sense. We'd be wasting a lot of time doing that, right? So yep. well, first we want to go find out, hey, are we qualified? Can we buy, can we buy a house? Right. And that's our debt. And then do we have the cash to put in? That's our equity. And now we have a target to go after as far as price. And that's what we always say at passive investing, get your money lined up first and then go look for deals, right? At least as best as you can get your money lined up first, then go look for deals. So, so that you don't waste a lot of time like John Sam. So John, tell us real quick, should you look at the market? What's your thoughts on this? Should you look at the market or the numbers first? Yeah. So you should always, when you're considering that, you should always look at the market first. You know, the, the way that I look at it is, you know, think about the, think about the amount of time that you will spend on the numbers. You know, that's probably going to be at least an hour, you know, cause you've got, you think about what you got to do. You got to come up with what your market rents are. You got to come up with what you think your expenses are. You know, what do you think you can get in, you know, rent growth, for example, um, and that's going to involve, you know, as we've talked about before, calling the competition, finding out how full they are, what they're charging. And that's, that's going to take you a lot of time. The amount of time it could take you to look into a market, it'll take some time, but it could very likely take a lot less. You know, I'll give you a good example. Um, we were actually just today discussing a deal at PassiveInvesting.com where we got we got a deal from a broker, very nice class A facility, a um, lot of business going on in the area near a major airport. Um, you know, from a couple of different perspectives, it looked great. Well, one of the things we looked at as part of this market analysis is the population growth. And we found out that there was negative uh, population growth in this particular market. And there was expected to be additional negative growth over the next five years. So we were able to quickly disqualify a deal there. 
Now, if we had looked at the numbers first, we would have seen really solid rents. We would have seen, you know, really solid occupancy. Uh, but we would have known that that's probably not sustainable when you've got negative population growth that's expected. So mm -hmm. we were able to save quite a bit of time by looking at the market first mm -hmm. on that particular deal. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this is in a gateway city, a uh, great deal, not far from the airport. Uh, beautiful, I think it was just recently built like in the last five years or something like that, multi-story. You know, so it's a nice deal, but like John was saying, hey, because population decline is happening, it's a tough sell to investors. It's a tough sell to us. Like, how do we actually sustain the market rents if population is slowly declining over time? How do we backfill if we end up raising rents and people move out, right? So those are some of the things that we think about. Now, if you lived there in that market, right, and you owned a few other deals there, maybe it would make sense as an add-on because you know the market well or you're able to market or get some economies of scale or whatever. But for us, it didn't make sense. For some group out there, it will. And I don't doubt it will go into contract uh, at some point in time and uh, trade hands. So for us, it didn't make sense. For somebody else, it will. For yourself, something like that still might make sense. It had a lot of, uh, one, one other uh, bullet point on that one was it did have a lot of, like you were saying, John, businesses and retail around. Uh, and it was a very densely populated area. So as a result, like there aren't going to be new homes coming in. There aren't going to be new, any new developments coming in. It's going to be the way it is, is the way it is, right? It's kind of landlocked at this point. So, uh, so that's why there could be a little bit of the population decline is because there's retail or whatever else happening. Uh, and that's okay. But again, you look at the market as a whole and then look at what are my constraints and what makes sense for us? Do we try to kind of fit this, you know, square peg in a round hole and make the deal work for us? No, it's not really worth our time, you know, to do that. We should move on to something else. So, um, that's right. Yeah. Third question real quick. So we're kind of going through the bullet points. We want to make sure we answer them uh, for you guys, but it's kind of worded a little weird on the, on the uh, webinar thing, but we asked, are your assumptions reasonable? John, can you kind of unpack that for the group? Like, what do we mean by assumptions and uh, what do we mean by them being reasonable? Sure. So when you're doing your underwriting and you're looking at the numbers part of this, you know, we are hopefully we've gotten some trailing 12 financials, you know, from the current owner. And so we know kind of how it's performed historically, but we're look, we're a, we're looking at this forward looking, you know, as an investment. So we're going to have to make some assumptions on, you know, like I mentioned before, rent growth, um, expense growth, you know, the occupancy that you can maintain, those are all assumptions that we have to put into our underwriting. And your market, you know, again, why you would look at the market first is because that will tell you, uh, it'll greatly inform what your assumptions should be. And so if you go kind of down the list of the things that you're going to need to form assumptions on, probably the biggest one is market rents. You know, and so to know that, you have to know a few things. One of the things you have to know is who is your customer. So you will find that out by looking at the market. You know, you, you look at uh, the population growth, you look at the, uh, you know, the median household income. Is this going to be a high income area where there's going to be a lot of affluent folks um, who may need storage? Uh, what are the home prices like? Um, you know, what are, who's, who's renting versus owning? Um, you know, and then who, who is the customer going to be? Can they afford the rents that you need to have in order for the deal to work. Um, an another one might be your, your rent growth, you know, and part of that's going to be, uh, you know, the, um, the population growth, what the comps look like. So if you call, for example, you might have a, a, a market that has very strong population growth and you might call the competition and you might find that they're mostly full. Well, that's great. Obviously, you know you can probably get some pretty solid rent growth if your if your supply is not quite keeping up with maybe what the demand is. Um, but you may also find the opposite. You might call the comps and they say, "Oh, I got plenty of you know these available," and you know uh, you might find out that okay, well maybe I'm not going to be able to get quite the rent growth that I think, or maybe I'm not going to be able to keep the occupancy that I need to keep. If everybody else is, you know, uh, has a lot of vacancy, what can I do to avoid that problem? How can I keep my facility, you know, occupied? 
Um, so those are some of the assumptions that you're going to have to think through. Another one would be what, you know, with your exit strategy, what cap rate do you think you're going to get when you exit? Well, the market is going to tell you that. So you'll be, you'll be wanting to look at again, you know, is this a market where other investors want to be? And in, in which case I'm probably going to be able to get a lower cap rate, higher exit price. Um, is it somewhere, um, you know, where, where you're going to have, um, you know, others, others who are, is it a very desirable market, you know, where people want to be in? So those are the things that these assumptions that you're going to have to, uh, you know, input into your underwriting model that the market is going to greatly inform what those assumptions are. You'll have to be able to tell, are these reasonable? What do I need to be hitting as far as assumptions go to make this deal work for my criteria? And can I get those in this market? Yeah, that's right. So we talked about obviously revenue growth expenses a little bit. I mean, we're going to obviously account for that, but maybe taxes might change. That's typically one of the largest line items in your expenses is going to be your property taxes. Um, so understanding that in that market, we obviously make phone calls to figure out, hey, where, where, where are we going to land here if we pay X for a deal? You know, trying to estimate that in the future. And then um, you talked about revenue or excuse me, rental rate increases, you know, whether the facilities are full or not. Um, will help you understand, hey, will I get 3% rental rate increases? If the facility, if the comps are full, it's likely, right? Not Nothing's a given, but it's likely. Uh, if the comps are 60% occupied, all of them are 60% occupied, it's gonna be a little harder to get that 3% rental rate increase because there's plenty of space, plenty of uh, supply there to meet the demand. So, um, yeah. and then we talked about cap rates, right? Um, cap rates are gonna be really important in understanding, hey, I think you hit it on the head. It kind of all ties back into the market again, right? Like are other REITs here or other groups here? And it doesn't have to be a REIT, but are other groups here? Is this a desirable place to be? Uh, how do I exit this deal if I need to? So if my debt is a five-year term or a 10-year term or whatever, life changes. Sometimes we want to hold things forever until we die. And then other times something comes up and we need to sell something or you know, vice versa, right? We're planning on selling it and we decide to hold it. So we want to know, hey, what is a exit strategy here? Who can we sell this deal to in the future? And if you run into a situation where, well, I'm kind of scratching my head, you know, who do we sell this to? That's, we were looking at a deal like that. We made an offer on it. Um, it's in Tennessee, Tennessee area. We state, I mean, <laughs> we, uh, we made an offer on it and uh, went back and forth negotiating the LOI and uh, the seller wanted a, a higher number. And we just went back and said, you know what? Our number is our number. And um, that's where we got to stay because we want to make sure we don't overpay in case like this, it's a little bit of a green area. Can we actually exit to another group who's willing to pay, you know, what we think the value is going to be in five years. And if the answer is no to that, then you might have to rethink your strategy. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, Chris, you also mentioned debt there. The lender is going to care a lot about the market. You know, so a lot of times that's another reason you need to look at things like this is because you're, especially if, you, if it's maybe a little greener market um, or a newer market, you're going to have to sell the lender on that market. So you're going to need to know, you know, some of the metrics that you need to talk about what sort of businesses are moving in, what kind of community investment is there? Because your lender is going to be very concerned with that. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. So it's always, it's never just you as far as like, um, and I don't mean you, John, I mean like us. It's never just us looking at a deal. And that's all the people here on the webinar, right? We're wanting to find deals um, and do deals. And we might need lenders to help us get there. Well, if we underwrite a deal, and it makes sense to us, but doesn't make sense to the lender who's always looking over our shoulder, then that's going to be a tough sell to them, right? So we have to understand the market first going in so that we can craft that story uh, for the lender and the appraiser, right? There's always the lender and the appraiser looking over your shoulder, double checking your numbers. Uh, so if the deal won't appraise, then you still don't have a deal. Even if you like the deal as an acquisition, um, if, if the lender can't get on board because the appraiser's not on board, because there's no value that the appraiser sees there, then it's going to be tough uh, to get that deal done. So great point. It seems like everything's kind of tying back, right? So uh, I see some, a question kind of coming here from Mark. He's asking, where do you typically position your rent level in the market? Um, we touched on that a little bit in our criteria from last week. I'll, I'll, I'll answer this one. Uh, we usually look for, I don't know if this is the direction you're going, Mark, but we look, usually look for on a non-climate controlled 10 by 10 
we want to see at least 70 cents a foot or at least renting for $70 a month, right? 10 by 10, 100 square feet, uh, $70 a month. So that's 70 cents a foot. So I'd rather be 80 or 90 cents a foot. That's a strong market for a non-climate controlled unit. The highest I've ever seen for non-climate was in Denver, no, uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado. It was like $180 for a non-climate controlled 10 by 10, which is insane. Um, so anyway, that's where we wanna see them around 70, 80 cents or more uh, per foot on a 10 by 10. And then um, uh, on a non-climate, we wanna see it over a dollar per foot on a 10 by 10 uh, climate controlled unit, I'm sorry. If it's $1.25, that's even better, right? That's where we wanna be. Cause then we know that, okay, the price on the units will usually inform you about the type of people that can afford that unit and the types of income that they have. Uh, the more you do this, you'll see it all kind of ties together. If the rents are high, generally means the market is pretty strong as far as demographics are concerned. If the rents are low, it probably means the demographic is a little bit weaker. If you look at the demographic first and you see incomes are pretty high, you can probably guess that the rates on the units will be high because the people in that area can afford it. So they kind of um, speak to one another in that sense. But let's talk real quick. We'll pivot real quick. <laughs> and Richard, we will come back. I see somebody else typing in the, uh, put in the Q&A. Can you repeat last week's bullet points? We will because I think that'll help you guys. We'll get to that in the Q&A, okay? We want to hit a real life example of a deal that we were looking at <clears throat> over in the San Antonio area. Um, and this was part of a broker deal. Let me see if I can share my screen and hopefully we won't get uh, slowed down like we did last week. All right, I'm going to move these off here. This is like the little chat in the Q&A boxes. Can you guys see that? I'm on Google Maps now. All right, John, can you see that? So make sure. I can see it. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is the address for the deal: five zero two six, oops, Sinclair Road, San Antonio, Texas, uh, seven eight two two two. So this deal was part of a larger portfolio. It was put out by Bellamy and Company. We're not like trying to hide anything here. So it's it was put out by Bellamy, um, and they had a portfolio. I think it was. I think it was like four in San Antonio and then three in Houston or something like that. So seven deals all together. Um, and let me go to the satellite view on this one. So we initially looked at this deal and I guess uh, we like the idea of having a portfolio and there was some pretty strong um, population growth. Cause I think they had like, you can see here, this is a little, probably a little bit older satellite image, but you can see here, there were some new homes coming in over here. So, I mean, just looking at this, right. It looks like it's pretty strong. It's pretty dense. Some of you guys might, somebody might live near here, but it's pretty dense. Okay. As far as population is concerned, but you zoom in on it a little bit more. And uh, again, it was a population or it was a uh, portfolio of, I think four deals in the San Antonio market, if I'm not mistaken. And what do you see here, John? Yeah, so I saw, of course, you mentioned the uh, the new homes that seem to be going in over there. So that's a good thing. Yeah, um, you do see some green space around, uh, you know, so you, you, which means you might have the potential to run into some competition. Uh, yep. You know, somebody could build some later. Um, re, this is repopulating. I don't know what happened. Google Maps. Yeah, yeah, it looks like farted, it's just updating there. Farted out. Um, um, yep. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so. You know, the new homes coming in is a good thing. Competition, that's a potential threat. Um, not insurmountable, but just something you have to think about when you're, again, when you're doing your underwriting. Um, if you if you kind of zoom out, uh, and maybe it'll take a little bit longer to, to do this, but if you were to zoom out a little bit, there we go. So you can see um, to the north, or, may, or maybe it, it, if you see where those uh, new homes are, again, just to the east, um, mm -hmm. yeah, right there. So that's a good thing. If you look at though, most of the other homes, and if you were to go down um, that, and maybe we don't do this because it'll, uh, it'll overload the, the yeah. capacity of the, yeah. but if you were to go down on street view, you know, for example, and look at those homes. And we also found this out from looking at the demographics from the, from the data that we use the, the homes down there are, you know, we were able to figure out, okay, these are not people who are going to be able to afford, you know, 110, 125 or higher in rents for a 10 by 10. These are much more, you know, um, kind of run down, uh, not very well maintained homes. Um, and, uh, and so we were able to see, okay, 
go, again, going back to who is your customer going to be, um, you know, we, we looked at the surrounding trade area there and we became concerned that we were not going to be getting the customers that we needed to be able to hit the assumptions that we needed to hit to make the deal work. Yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly right. So did we spend any time underwriting this deal? Uh, not nearly as much as we, as we would have. No, exactly. Right. So we jumped into a little bit and realized, no, the market had population growth. And you have to like, again, look into that and say, okay, why is population growing? Oh, it's because they had some new homes coming in over here. Great. Or if you're looking in a particular market somewhere else, why is population growing? Well, there's new homes, there's this and that new apartment complex, you know, something like that. So that's, that will show up in the data that there's people moving in, but then you want to dig a little bit deeper. Well, where are they moving to? Uh, you know, is it easily accessible? This facility, if you look here, you can get there from these homes, a little bit of a drive. Sometimes these um, highways act as like a mental barrier uh, to people trying to get to a particular location. If the majority of the customers here, so that to say is, okay, these new home people may not drive this way. They may end up going this way uh, to another facility because this side of town is on the wrong side of the highway, in other words. Right. So it's not where they want to be because the majority of the customers and the way that this facility is maintained is not going to be. Uh, let's pretend it's a class C facility, which I think it was. I'm not, I can't remember. The portfolio was kind of wide as far as class A to class C. But let's say it's an older facility. Well, it'll attract a certain type of tenant. Right. So if I have a new home that's three hundred fifty four thousand dollars, I may not want to store my stuff here because of the look and curb appeal of the facility. Right. So just kind of just jumping in and saying, okay, what type, who is my customer? Like John's saying, where do they come from? Who is my customer base that's there right now? Do I need to change it in some way? Do I need to get the customers from over here? Who am I competing against to be able to do that? You know, so like it's all these things that come together so that when I get into my underwriting and the broker package, oops, I just restarted again. The broker package might be telling me, they might be projecting, I don't know, 4% rental rate increases. And then you look at the market and you're like, wait a second, there's no way I get to 4% because of X, Y, and Z. Or at least I don't think that's going to happen. I think 3% is more realistic. Or the broker package might say 3%, but they miss something. And you realize, oh my gosh, no, no, no. We got a whole new development, 3,000 homes coming in over here, you know, whatever. I think we can hit 4% rental rate increases. So you got to look at the market and that will inform your underwriting before you actually jump into all the specifics of the deal itself. So we passed on this. And again, there's four um, facilities in this market that was sold as a portfolio. And we just ended up passing on it because each of the locations was something similar to this. It wasn't like, a, it wasn't a market we wanted to be. And if you zoom in on this, if I zoom in on this, you can see this is like a, this is not part of the deal. It's like a junkyard. I don't want that, right? I don't, I don't want that. And then around here is more industrial type uses, you know, shipping containers. And this is like the garbage thing and Republic services, waste management. Like this is not where I want to be. So that's all like, but, but that doesn't mean this is a bad deal. It's just not a deal for us, right? It may not be a deal for you, but it might be a deal for somebody else on this webinar. So that's criteria is going to be specific to you. We're just kind of giving you some high level things to consider as you look at a market. I know people and John knows people that we, they do deals in rural markets, right? I know a guy who actually bought a deal. He owns 11 or 12 within the Charlotte market itself. Uh, usually like, you know, roughly 50,000 square feet on average, he bought a small 14,000 square foot facility in a extremely tertiary market in the Charlotte area, just himself. He just went and bought it. So like everybody has their own criteria, right? You might think, why would that guy do that? I don't know, but everybody has their own criteria, what makes sense for them. So that was the example we wanted to talk about and just saying, look, look at the market and see, you know, what makes sense for you and then go from there. First have your finance side of things kind of lined up and then jump into the market uh, and then jump into the numbers on the deal after that. Um, yeah. All right, John, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I was just going to say you brought, you brought up a good, a good point, kind of circling back to the title of our webinar here. This deal for sure meets somebody's investment criteria. It just wasn't ours. You know? So that's why it's important to have it set up ahead of time so that you know, maybe this is a deal that you want to look at. Maybe that's your specialty is, your, is the rural tertiary markets. Then this would, of course, be a good deal for you to look at. And the other thing I would say, too, is it was reminding me as you were zooming out, you know, on at face value, 
we heard, you know, we had this portfolio that we were looking at in San Antonio and Houston. Okay. So if you just think San Antonio and Houston in general, those are going to be great markets to look in. You know, those, those markets are really hot right now in Texas, you know, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin. So, you know, you might think um, off, off the bat, well, yeah, maybe this is a really good, maybe this is going to be a really solid market that we want to be in. It's going to fit our criteria, but you have to look further than just what city is it in? Because if you, when you zoom out there, you saw that this was a good bit outside of, you know, the heart of San Antonio where there's a lot of storage demand right now. Um, so that's just why you have to know what your criteria is, what you're after, and then look at the market and does that fit where your criteria is. Yep, that's exactly right. So, um, all right, so I'm looking in the Q&A, guys, that's, that's kind of what we had. It's about 12.35 now. We're happy to answer any questions on this topic or anything else related to self-storage. Uh, and if we can't get to it here, then we're happy to have you guys hop over to the Facebook group. Um, I did put the links in the chat. So if you scroll up a little bit, um, I think, let's see. Yeah, there we go. I'll pop them in the chat again. Um, so if you guys need to get to the Facebook group, it's that last link down there and we can follow up with any questions that we miss here, okay? But back to Richard's question uh, real quick. Repeat last week's bullets. We will do that real quick. So the five data points we look at, and then we, actually I forgot to mention the two bonus data points, but the five data points we'll look at, population growth, average household income, median household income, and we want the average to be above the median, the median house value, and the supply of storage, so square feet per person how much supplies in the market. I'll come back to that one in a second. The two others that we forgot, I forgot to mention earlier at the top of this webinar was average rents for a 10 by 10 non-climate and climate controlled unit, which we covered that. So at least 70 cents a foot on the non-climate, preferably 80 or 90 cents. Um, and then climate controlled minimum of a dollar per foot, preferably a buck 25 or more per foot on climate controlled. And then I wanna know, are there any new home builders nearby? I look on Zillow or Realtor.com. Realtor.com is actually the better source for that up-to-date information, but look on either one of those websites or apps and figure out if there's any new homes coming in nearby because we're kind of drafting off of them, right? Back in the day, if McDonald's picked a location, that must have been a good location. So you saw it at McDonald's and a Burger King and <laughs> Wendy's and other things pop up nearby, right? McDonald's kind of led the way in that. We think that DR Horton, Meritage Homes, Lennar, Ryan, all the builders out there have already done their homework on where it, uh, a good place is for residential housing for people to move to. And so if we know that they're willing to build nearby, then it's likely gonna be a high growth or at least a solid growth uh, area in the future. So we wanna know other new home builders nearby. That won't always be the case, right? If you're looking in a primary market that's been built out and it's like got 100,000 people within a three mile radius, Sorry, if you heard the baby in the background, but uh, if it's got a lot of people uh, in 100,000 100, people in a three mile radius, that's a pretty dense populated uh, area. But um, generally speaking, we wanna look and see if there's new home builders nearby. If you had to ask, and I know I'm talking here a bit, uh, but if you had to ask like, hey, what is most important? That's a lot, Chris. Like, what the heck? How do I figure all that out? What's most important? Population growth, I would say, John. And then we wanna see rental rates, right? Being strong, because that informs us of the population around there. We wanna see stronger rental rates. And then supply is interesting because we wanna know, dig into that a little bit more. Uh, but what would you say is kind of the most important from those? Yeah, I would also add um, household income to that, you know, that's gonna, which that's gonna kind of go along with your competition rents, like you mentioned. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah I think those are important. Very good, yep. And then square feet per person, don't get scared of that, guys and gals, because you just want to dig in to figure out why square feet per person, 10 or 15 or five, you know, just kind of dig into that a little bit more. So that's last week bullet points, Richard, that's for you and for everybody else out there. Uh, let's see, Mark, I got to that question earlier on. We just covered it again on the uh, rents that you look for. Um, looking in the Q&A, let's see, Eric is asking uh, a little bit long here, but for an out-of-state investor like myself, just starting in the self-storage space, what criteria or criteria should I consider in selecting the geographic location of where I should begin my investing? So that's, uh, okay, so ideally I would, like to, I would like them to be in closer proximity to each other instead of spread over a large geographic location. So he means the facilities. So like, where should I look? And then how should I like target, I guess, is what he's trying to say, like looking for these deals. Cause he's saying, I don't want them spread out over a large geographic location. 
which might become unsustainable to manage over the uh, long run. John, what would you say to that? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yep. Um, yeah, I would say, I would say the same thing. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, when you're just getting started um, out of state, um, you know, you definitely need to be looking, um, you know, at, at whatever sub market it is, look very closely. Um, and uh, as far as criteria, you know, yeah, you want that stronger uh, population growth closer together is good. I think yeah. um, from a management perspective, um, you know, uh, d especially depending on if you're planning on, you know, doing more of the management yourself or outsourcing that to someone else. Um, yeah. That's, that's definitely better. Uh, yeah. Um, particularly when you're getting started. Yeah. I think when, when we started looking for deals, we looked mostly just in the Charlotte MSA. Uh, we looked at some stuff in Raleigh, because we knew that market, it's only a two hour drive away. So, um, you know, that was okay for us. Um, so I would say everybody usually says the same thing within your hometown area and then within about two hours drive because you can get there, do what you gotta do and get back in a day, right? So everybody says that. And now it might get hard to find deals because you might be tapped, like there's no deals on the market. You look on LoopNet, you look other places and there's no deals. And the ones you've already looked at have been sitting there for like three months and you know why, or. I guess six or nine months and you know why they are because they're overpriced usually. So it becomes a little tough, but there, then you start making either phone calls or sending out letters to people. We don't have time to get into like how to do all that right now, but those are some options um, that you can do to try and find deals off market and talk to owners directly. You can also drive by them and just pop in. If it's a smaller deal, usually the owner is the one who manages it themselves, right? So if you pop in, they might actually be there. You just talk to them directly face to face. Um, so there's a couple of things that you can do to try and find those deals at a certain point. It's okay to go out further, right? I'm not saying stay in your market. When you start, you can go out further also. Like there's no problem with that. Masha who we had on the podcast, um, the other week, she's pretty active on LinkedIn and all that. She just bought her first deal. She lives in Florida, Miami. She bought a deal in North Carolina, about an hour away from where we live here in Charlotte. So, and it's a 14,000 square foot deal. So she, that's like what, three States away. So, but she did the same thing. She started close and then realized I can't find any deals, at least that meet my criteria. So I need to get out further. And that's what she did. And she found one in North Carolina. So there, there are ways to get around that. Um, but ideally starting out, start close to home and then don't be afraid to branch out from there because it'll probably find a deal outside of your hometown area. Hope that helps. Um, David is asking, what, what was the ask cap rate on that deal? I think he's talking about the San Antonio deal. Do you remember? I don't remember. I believe it was a seven twenty five on the stabilized, uh, the stabilized income. Okay, so do you? So what, so let's talk about that real quick. So when you say stabilized, was the broker meaning once you buy it and stabilize it, or did it, did they mean out the gate like day one that's, cap rate? That's right. You buy it, you get the rents where uh, you know they said that the market rents will be. Uh, get it there, get the expenses under control. And then a, I believe it was a seven twenty five off of that. Okay, so probably going in was like six or probably a probably, five. Yeah, was probably high fives, low sixes. Yeah, yeah. The, the rents were not too far below market on yeah. that one. So, yeah, there was a mix of uh, I think the San Antonio. There was four deals in San Antonio, and those were the better ones. The ones in Houston weren't quite as good. It was a seven property portfolio, David, uh, and the four in San Antonio were nicer. I think one of them had just had some addition put on like in 2018, but the rest of them were like built in the 60s and 70s, believe it or not. So I think in the 80s as well. So a little bit older, um, older stuff. And again, that's not going to work for what we're doing. So and there's nothing wrong with that. We've bought deals like that in the past. There's nothing wrong with those. It's just right now that doesn't meet our criteria. So, and you guys can't be afraid either. So I think the question David asking is really good on the cap rate. Oftentimes we get kind of stuck on that, right? Like what's my going in cap? What's well, a five? I'm paying too much. Not necessarily, right? You might be paying a four or whatever. And I know that's hard to make the numbers work. I'm kind of using a uh, stream example, but you're paying a four cap. Well, what can you do in the next year as far as value add, managing it right, you know, whatever, uh, to run it right. And then you think, yeah, but then I'm paying the seller for me to go do all the work. Yes, you are. Like that's where the market is right now. <laughs> if you aren't willing to do that on some deals, then you're not going to be able to do them. Right. So there's, you're not going to find a deal with a savvy seller. Uh, even, I mean, we've dealt with all kinds of sellers. I 
have not found one seller who has like 30,000 existing square feet, two acres to expand, and he's going to sell it to you at the exact right price and not price in the potential of what you could develop right there, right? In other words, he's going to charge you for all of that together, even though you haven't done any work and you're going to take on all the development risk and the lease up risk on that two acres. That is the way that it is uh, right now in the storage space, almost like in uh, single family homes. Uh, and it's been in the storage space, it's been like that for quite some time. Um, so don't get too caught up on the cap rates. I remember hearing a story from, I think it was public storage. I didn't hear it, but it was told to uh, us in a group in like a seminar slash conference setting for storage investors. Uh, he said, hey, I was at, and this is an institutional guy. I was at a meeting where public storage, either the public storage or extra space bought a deal. They paid a four cap on it. And somebody had asked him that, like, why did you guys pay a four cap on that deal? He said, because I don't care what the going in cap rate is because within a year, we apply our management best practices to it. And now it's at an eight, you know, and then from there in years two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, it's even better than that for us. So that's how we look at the deal. And really that's where we're at right now in this market. A um, couple more questions rolling in from Robert. We'll stick around here for a few more minutes. Usually we try to end about now, but I think you got some questions here. So uh, Robert says, I'll ask this here because it's not exactly on topic. Feel free to reach out after the webinar is over. I'm selling a single family rental. I need to park the money somewhere to avoid capital gains. Does passive investing in a self-storage deal qualify for a 1031 exchange? Uh, John, does investing in a self-storage deal qualify for a 1031 exchange coming from a single family home rental? Short answer is yes. Um, yeah. The also caveat I will, I will add as I add when I answer any tax question is talk to your tax advisor before you do anything. There you go. Yep. Um, Steven's asking, please talk about buying an existing facility versus building on entitled self-storage land. Um, I guess he's got something for sale. So please talk about buying an existing facility versus building on entitled self-storage land. I guess uh, the pros and cons maybe of those two things. Yeah, that's what I would, I, I'm, Stephen, I'm thinking that's what you're, what you're getting at there. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to think about um, on an existing facility. Of course, you don't have the development risk. Um, if it's, maybe it is, or maybe it's not a lease up deal. Maybe you bought something that's already fully, uh, you know, stabilized and it's just a good place to park money. Um, you know, the, you have those advantages. You you got a, generally a little bit less risk to deal with um, on building. You know, you have your development risk, and there's a lot that's tied up in that. Particularly right now, what everybody's talking about is the cost of materials. You know, our our steel prices are super high. Um, labor is high as well right now from a construction standpoint. Um, so you've got that risk that you've got to deal with and not, not saying it's not a good time to do development. Um, but that's just one of the, when you're thinking pros and cons, uh, that's one thing you have to think about. Um, you also, particularly on entitled self-storage land, you know, the nice thing about that is that you don't have to deal with, uh, you know, getting something rezoned or, you know, something, something like that. Um, the, the flip side though, that you have to consider is, okay, if there's green space around you that can be built on, is that entitled for self storage? And if it is, then you may have some competition risk there. If it's, if it's easy for you to build something there, then it'd be just as easy for someone else to build something just up the street from you. So those are some of off the top of my head, some of the pros and cons uh, that you want to be thinking about. Yeah. And I think uh, also if you have something to sell, which it looks like you have in the parentheses there, Stephen, uh, have product for sale or have some product for sale, then uh, really depends on the group that you're talking to as well. So some groups might not, they would be okay doing development because they have another development nearby or another facility nearby. And they would just bring the two together, you know, and have like a uh, secondary location or something like that. So really a lot depends on who you're planning on selling to whether you use a broker to do that, they have other relationships with other uh, investors and uh, acquisition groups who are willing to do take on entitled self-storage land. So there's definitely value to it also. So if you already got it entitled and let's say it's in a market where, you know, entitling is really hard to do, right? A higher barrier to entry type market. Well, hey, that's great. If it's not, that's okay. It's already entitled. Somebody else might have to go through the same process on an adjacent parcel, right? And it might take them some time 
uh, to do that and get approved. Whereas if somebody bought your parcel, they can get it going right away, right? Start breaking ground and they can break ground right away. So really just depends on what you want to do and your plans for the future. So some folks only buy existing facilities. So it really just depends on who you plan on marketing uh, the deal for sale to. Uh, David's asking, what are your criteria? Well, we look for population growth of at least one and a half percent. Don't copy ours, right? What you got to do, what makes sense for you, but this is maybe a starting point. Okay. And this is kind of minimum. So one and a half percent population growth. Uh, it's okay if it's a less than one and a half, there's not a hard cutoff there, but we want to see population growth, preferably one and a half percent average household income, at least 60,000 median, at least 50. That's kind of gets you in the door of what makes sense. If it's under that, I'm like, it's pretty much a no from us. Uh, we have seen there are plenty of markets where median and average incomes are less than that. We won't even go there. Uh, median house value. That's kind of a, um, that just informs you of what the curb appeal is of the surrounding area. So right now we have a deal in Charlotte, the median house value, I forgot what it is. It's in, it's like in the high ones, something like that. And that's just cause it's older homes for the most part. Uh, but the incomes average pretty high, close to a hundred thousand, uh, up to 150. So people ha- are pretty well off. They just live in older homes in the area, but at least about 150,000 median household uh, income, or excuse me, median house value. That will give me, give me an idea of the area. If I see a two in front, if it's 200,000, 300,000, that's like, this is a good area. Like I know that right away. Uh, and then supply of storage, I don't worry about that. We don't worry about that too much. Um, it's just interesting to know. And we want to dig in to see why supply might be 10 or 15 square feet per person versus seven or five or whatever. All right. So those are what we look for. Population growth, at least one and a half percent. Average household income, 60,000. Median at 50. Uh, higher is better. Median house value, 150. Higher is better. Supply of storage. We just want to know what it is and then figure out why it is that way. All right. And then uh, Scott's asking, what is the best practice to get deal flow? I am not seeing enough deals that work. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> yep. Uh, John, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I think there's um, a couple of different ways. You know, one of them, depending, depending on where you are, whether you're starting out, whether you've you know, got a reputation in the space, we get a lot of ours from brokers. You know, um, Chris does a really good job of nurturing our relationships with brokers. You know, you want to take care of them. If you get a deal from a broker that you're looking at, you want to get them feedback when you say you're going to get them feedback. Um, that's, the, that's, in my opinion, the, the best way right now. Um, another way would be to invest in some type of, uh, you know, data software, whether that's, I know we've talked before about different, um, you know, places to get that. But maybe the best thing for you would be to look up uh, facilities and just call owners directly. Um, that can take a little bit more time to do, but depending on your criteria, what you're looking for, that might be the best thing for you. Yeah. So those are two options I'd recommend. Yeah, there you go. So it really depends on the kind of deal you're looking at. And we've done both. We sent out, we've sent out letters, we've made phone calls direct, and we work through brokers. And uh, of course, if you're working through a broker, I think sometimes in our head, at least in my head too, you know, you're going to pay, you know, a high price. That's the broker's job, but you also look at deals that other, um, that you just won't get to look at because it's a larger deal. Maybe it's a sophisticated or a larger group and that's how they're going to sell the deal. And so the deal is in a great market, you know, solid location. Well, that's going to go to a broker because they want the best price for it. So you have to be willing to say, okay, there's a trade-off there. Um, but I'm going to get a deal that's going to be in a solid location uh, that's high barrier to entry or whatever. Or you might go direct to owners. Well, what's the trade-off there? The trade-off is, as John and I know, uh, <laughs> dealing with owners, sometimes direct guys and gals, there's no such thing as a handshake deal. Everybody likes to say, oh yeah, we do the deal. You know, I used to do it by the handshake. Well, the reason they came with the contracts is because all the guys and gals who did it with the handshake ended up violating their handshake deal, right? So uh, you're going to have people who want to do it that way. They don't want to do a contract. They don't have an attorney. Uh, their financials are all messed up. It's going to take you hours to figure out, does the deal even make any money? Um, and then their tax returns aren't going to show all the income. So you're going to have trouble getting financed right now. There's not every mom and pop is like that. That's kind of, uh, I, every mom and pop I've ever dealt with does have weird, um, records, Okay. I don't think I've ever dealt with one that had like nice, clean records. They always have weird records that you have to kind of figure out the actual cash flows of the deal. On the extreme end, you might get the guy or gal, the seller who just doesn't want to do any paperwork. They don't want to use an attorney and all that. And honestly, on those kind of deals, I would just walk away. 
because uh, it's not worth the headache or the loss uh, of money over time. You got to have an attorney involved and you got to have a contract. There is no way to get around those two things. All right. All right. That's all I think that we got, right, John? Yep. That's it. All right. It's uh, 1254. We stayed a little bit longer because you guys had some more questions or whatnot. Uh, if you want to interact a little bit more, go ahead and hop into the Facebook group. I do see Scott asking a question there. Uh, we Real quick, Yardi Matrix or Radius Plus. Yardi Matrix is going to give you all the owner data direct phone number to their cell phone, address to their home. Uh, Yardi is the best, costs the most. Radius is more towards managers. All right, just wanna answer that question for Scott real quick. But look into either one of those options. All right, guys, that's it for now. Uh, we will see you same time, I think, next week. I think Dan's gonna be with you guys. Oh no, I'm with you guys next week. So I'll see you guys uh, next week. And John will be back in a couple of weeks talking about um, some of the numbers and what he does uh, when underwriting deals. So thanks guys, appreciate it. Thanks everybody.